to go ahead and turn things over to Peggy Simonson. Peggy's been a volunteer with Citizens for Conservation for 16 years. She's a former president of CFC and continues to serve on the board of directors. Peggy is currently chair of CFC's Community Education Committee. Peggy? Thank you, Liz. Uh, I also, in addition to Citizens for Conservation, am on the board of the Chicago Living Corridors. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of a background about that before we turn it over to our speaker. The Chicago Living Corridors was founded, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. It was founded a few years ago now uh, with the intent of, of identifying, no, no, back. <laughs> go back. There we go. Uh, we want to focus on private property. There's a lot of organizations that are working on public property, uh, like the forest preserves and, and, and parks and so forth. Uh, but most of the property in Illinois is in private ownership. And in our area, most of that is in people's yards. And so our, our, our mission and our goal was to map private property that's already been improved uh, with native plantings with quality habitat in the greater Chicago area. And this map uh, is on our website at chicagolivingcorridors.org. Uh, and there it's interactive, but the, but the idea is each of these different colors indicates a different organization that helps people identify or plan uh, to improve the habitat in their property. For example, the green are the areas that uh, Citizens for Conservation works. Uh, the red is uh, the uh, Conservation Foundation, which is uh, the, pro the uh, organization that, that created the uh, um, Conservation at Home program, uh, but with sim similar goals, all of it. And let's go to the next slide, Jeff. The, um, the, there we go. Uh, these are the organizations that founded Chicago Living Quarters. Citizens for Conservation, as I mentioned, our program is called Habitat Corridors. And the Wildflower uh, Preservation and Propagation Committee is in, in McHenry County. Their program is called A Natural Garden in Your Yard. The Conservation at Home program is used by a number of organizations, but started by the Conservation Foundation, and then two Wild Ones chapters. These were the organizations that got together to start Chicago Living Corridors, but since then, uh, we've included these additional organizations that are listed here, uh, all of whom do yard visits in order to help people uh, maybe identify what's, what the invasives are or, or, or look at some difficult areas and make recommendations for the kind of natural native plants to put in them. So that's our focus. Uh, but we are an umbrella organization. So Chicago Living Quarters itself does not actually do the work, but we're coordinating both with the organizations that do. And as I showed you the map, so you can take a look at the map and if you are interested in getting your dot on the map, you need to do so through one of these organizations. So you can look at the map, find out which organization works in your area, and, and then either give them a call or go onto the website. The Chicago Living Corridors website also has a wealth of, of resources for you uh, to look at. They're just um, all sorts of things on how to get started or on, on good plant selections and uh, lots of videos, the previous videos that were done from these programs that the library has been uh, collaborating with, CF with CLC about. Uh, we also have those videos on the website. So uh, lots of resources for you there. So next slide, Jeff. What can you do? We are encouraging people to plant native plants for sure. Uh, join one of these participating organizations in order to get your uh, native garden or your habitat on the map. And we also encourage vo volunteers with Chicago Living Corridors. We're doing all our programs, thanks to the library. We're doing them now by Zoom. We're not trying to do in-person programs, uh, but we still have behind the scenes work if anybody's interested in helping us out. And you can uh, contact us on the website and just get on the website and see, get, get a bigger background of, and picture of, of who we are and what we do. So now I am very pleased to be able to introduce Jeff Weiss, our speaker tonight. Uh, he has designed and helped to implement more than 50 green infrastructure projects with many community partners. Many of these projects focus on habitat corridors, including streams and rights of way. Uh, Jeff is also uh, the... Um, 
currently coordinator of the Flint Creek and Spring Creek Watersheds Partnership in the, in the Greater Barrington area. And those are examples of green infrastructure projects where it's not one homeowner that owns it, but the, the Flint Creek runs through a number of, of properties. And so the coordination of those is an appropriate thing. Jeff will provide examples, lessons learned and funding sources for green infrastructure opportunities that, you, that can be employed maybe on private property, but also on homeowner association common areas. So uh, in addition to the Flint Creek uh, and, and Spring Creek watersheds, uh, Jeff founded and leads the Buffalo Creek Clean Water Partnership in Buffalo Grove, which was named Lake County Stormwater Management Commission's Stewardship of the Year in 2016. He's president of Living Lands Conservation Company, which provides environmental consulting and on the ground ecological restoration service. So we're going to hear from Jeff today on the whole business of green, ABCs of green infrastructure. So Jeff. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Peggy. And uh, uh, I just, Oh, well, I want to thank and welcome everybody who's joined tonight. And uh, this is a topic that I dearly love and I can talk for hours. So uh, to kind of head me off at the past, I urge you to put your uh, questions in the chat and uh, that will give Liz the opportunity to uh, pick a question every now and then that we can stop and get into a, a discussion and uh, drill down a little bit and maybe slow me down from, from just uh, droning on. So um, I really appreciate your uh, uh, being here, but please participate with me. And I wanna just react to a couple of the things Peggy mentioned uh, in her remarks about Chicago Living Corridors. I went to some of the very early meetings of the group, including one uh, uh, at Millennium Park uh, several years ago. So I, I've uh, kind of watched this organization uh, develop and it's doing great work. Another organization that I was involved in very early on in my conversion from corporate guy to nature guy was uh, Citizens for Conservation. And so um, my wife and I started a group in Buffalo Grove called the Buffalo Grove Environmental Action Team, but it was in definitely inspired by Citizens for Conservation in, in Barrington. Uh, also, um, when I started the Buffalo Creek Clean Water Partnership, I talked with uh, Meredith Tucker, who was the coordinator of the uh, Flint Creek Watershed Group. So that was also inspiring. Uh, <clears throat> so now that I've uh, taken a job with the uh, Flint Creek Spring Creek Watershed Partnership, uh, which is sponsored by Citizens for Conservation, I kind of feel like I've gone back uh, to the mothership and uh, Hopefully we'll be able to contribute uh, in return for some of the uh, uh, many things that I've learned and gained from my association with those two organizations over the years. Uh, but my talk tonight is about uh, ABCs of green infrastructure. And I uh, suppose that almost everyone on this call, perhaps other than a few uh, family members who uh, uh, I noticed uh, are, are present, uh, uh, two of my daughters and my aunt and uncle, uh, you know, just they're giving me uh, positive vibrations. But I'm going to imagine the rest of you are fairly knowledgeable about green infrastructure, uh, but maybe are reluctant to get started and own a project or, uh, you know, would like some helpful pointers about things to do in your own yard, or maybe even uh, get more involved in uh, Citizens for Conservation or our watershed group. So, uh, I'm trying to accomplish uh, many uh, uh, things, and, and that's another reason to slow me down and, and make this worth your while by asking your questions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to come back to this slide, but uh, this is uh, uh, part of my green infrastructure experience. It's the park across the street. It's named after my wife, Martha Weiss. Um, how do you get a park named after you? Well, it, uh, uh, when this park sign was first put up, uh, a lot of people would approach me and say, oh, I'm so sorry uh, about Martha. And I said, oh, no, she's fine. Uh, so I, I, I think people have a, a belief that you can't get a park named after you while I'm alive or while you're alive. But my wife uh, uh, belies that idea. And, and this is definitely our grandkids' favorite park. Um, but to kind of review the idea of living corridors, um, we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of different 
topics on uh, green infrastructure. But one of the central concepts and really the founding idea of the Chicago Living Quarters organization is that we've got some splendid natural areas around the Chicago area. Some of them are very large, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them uh, further down the line. But it is really, really important for genetic material to move back and forth between these large areas called core areas. And that's where this idea of corridors come, comes in. So plants can spread their uh, pollen and their pollinators and animals can move back and forth to uh, meet their needs for food, shelter, uh, and uh, uh, all of their other needs. Um, by moving between these uh, natural areas uh, and uh, these corridors are critical. So they can be large or small, they can be piecemeal or they can be continuous, uh, but uh, in the village of Buffalo Grove, and I'm gonna give uh, some case study material in a little bit, uh, we've established a green infrastructure network uh, connecting these places and the village has uh, started a, a, a campaign uh, calling these areas that we are uh, restoring and developing as green infrastructure and maintaining, they're calling them village gems. So I'm really proud of the work that we're doing in Buffalo Grove. And one of the key things about our work in Buffalo Grove is that these are smaller sites. So unlike some of the large areas that Citizens for Conservation and other groups are protecting and restoring and maintaining, uh, these are small areas. These are all, uh, uh, with a couple of exceptions, these are all under 10 acres. And uh, there are many of these opportunities that are important uh, areas for, uh, for green infrastructure. And uh, um, they add to the total inventory of areas that are uh, habitat and uh, uh, can provide a sanctuary for some of these natural resources. Uh, so things I'm gonna talk about tonight are some examples of things that are not green infrastructure. I will give uh, some examples of projects, uh, large and small, um, and then come back to this idea of the green infrastructure network that we're building in Buffalo Grove and how you can get involved in your own community um, to uh, uh, help build these types of uh, programs. And then I'm gonna bring it back one more time, uh, back to the living corridors idea. So um, that's our agenda for this evening. And uh, this picture, you'll see it again, but um, the heart of green infrastructure, at least the way I practice it, is using these native plants uh, with these deep root systems. They help infiltrate stormwater. Uh, they store carbon. Uh, they help these plants make it through drought. They provide uh, underground habitat for uncounted uh, 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 tiny microorganisms and provide a range of other benefits. So while these plants are delightful above ground and they have a range of colors and forms and uh, pollinators and everything else, a, a lot of the action is going on underground. And that is one of the reasons why uh, we use these native plants. Another purpose of showing this picture is to make the comparison with that plant in the middle called uh, Kentucky bluegrass. And I will get back to uh, that plant, but you can see that the inch deep root systems uh, are not uh, uh, comparable in any way with, the, uh, with these native plants. And so with that, I'd like to just jump into some examples of not green infrastructure. Um, this is kind of a classic uh, golf course picture, but you see this, you've seen this in other places. Uh, where the turf grass, the mowed turf grass right to the edge of a pond or a stream uh, is uh, slumping and breaking off and causing erosion and uh, uh, sediment to get into the water. Uh, this is not green infrastructure. Uh, here's another case. Uh, this is an eroded uh, stream bank. And uh, th this is fairly typical of urban streams uh, where the, uh, the, the steep uh, stream banks uh, are continuously, load, continuously eroding and causing uh, trees to topple into the creek uh, and creating debris jams and other issues, uh, not green infrastructure. And this is our, uh, one of our nemesis plants, uh, uh, European buckthorn. Uh, this plant uh, is, uh, has, has so many um, 
bad qualities. I'm not going to enumerate them. But um, the, uh, the, one of the latest is that it turns out that all parts of this plant can't contain a toxin uh, that is lethal to, especially to amphibians. So in addition to sterilizing the ground and changing the soil chemistry, uh, wherever buckthorn infests an area, it is also toxic to some of our most uh, uh, rare and uh, beneficial wildlife. And here's uh, another one uh, uh, with some of the same bad habits as buckthorn. This is uh, oriental um, uh, honeysuckle. Uh, and this plant is the first thing to leaf out in spring and the last thing to lose its leaves in fall. And so it completely shades out the, the canopy in the forest or anywhere it, it takes over. And the ground underneath it is totally sterile and uh, definitely not green infrastructure. Uh, here's some more common uh, plants uh, that are used in landscape um, horticulture, and they all escape into our natural areas and cause a lot of harm. Uh, Doug Ptolemy, who is a common speaker, uh, uh, categorizes uh, plants into three varieties. Uh, plants that add to the uh, uh, food web, uh, plants that are neutral to the new food web, and plants that are detrimental to the food web. By that he means uh, plants that are capable of supporting the insects, pollinators, and especially the caterpillars uh, that all of our bird species and, and some other uh, uh, animals need to uh, support them. And these three are examples of plants that take energy out of the uh, native ecosystems by, uh, and are, do not provide any habitat value for these uh, beneficial organisms that we all depend on, not green infrastructure. And here's uh, a couple of other uh, common invasive plants. Uh, this is a wonderful stand of garlic mustard. I was pulling garlic mustard all, all afternoon today, trying to eliminate the last of it in one of our parks. Um, and a common teasel, which has become an uh, a, a, a really, really common site along all of our roadways and uh, edges. And, and, and these plants, uh, uh, basically uh, inhibit and prevent our native plants from, from, from flourishing, not green infrastructure. And finally, I call this group uh, the unholy trinity, uh, reed canary grass, uh, phragmites, and uh, narrow leaf cattail. Uh, these are the common plants of our wetlands. Uh, they are very invasive. They exclude other plants uh, they do not support uh, wildlife populations. And uh, um, I'm working uh, locally and uh, Citizens for Conservation is leading the charge in uh, taking steps to replace these uh, uh, bad plants, these bully plants with uh, beneficial plants, particularly uh, sedges, native sedges that they call warrior sedges. So I have some more on that in a few slides. Now we're coming to the home landscape and uh, back to the subject of this, uh, of these perfect bluegrass uh, lawns. Uh, they're also, uh, uh, bluegrass lawns are also suburban deserts. And of course they require uh, lots of inputs in the form of fertilizers and pesticides. And uh, if you wanna keep them green all summer in our climate, you have to water them all the time. All of those are, uh, uh, resources that uh, could go to uh, more worthy causes. So again, back to Doug Ptolemy, he urges uh, shrinking down the turf grass areas of our home landscapes and using these native plants for the many benefits uh, that they will provide, including uh, reducing these uh, fossil fuel inputs, water resources, and uh, the lack of benefit for any other living things provided in these uh, uh, perfect lawns we, we seem to love. And finally, uh, the last non-green infrastructure uh, is this uh, uh, industry that seems to have popped up of going out and uh, spraying mosquitoes in people's backyards. Uh, not only is it not effective, uh, the only effective treatment for mosquitoes is larvicides. Uh, because they move around and, the, and uh, just because you killed them off in your yard, uh, they'll just come in from adjoining properties. But the 
pesticides that they use are not effective against mosquitoes, but they are extremely effective uh, in killing every other kind of insect that might be on your property. And uh, I, this is my uh, lame attempt at photoshopping what happens when a, a monarch comes across a yard that's recently been sprayed by, by Mosquito Joe, and uh, that is uh, not green infrastructure. So um, having uh, given you several ideas of things that are not green infrastructure, here's a list of the types of projects that I've been associated with. And again, these uh, beneficial and wonderful plants that we use uh, for the, these types of projects. So um, I uh, teach ecological restoration at Morton Arboretum and uh, retired from College of Lake County and Oakton Community College. So um, I, I I love uh, re restoring prairies, woodlands, and wetlands. Uh, and uh, there's many large projects going on in our forest preserves and in our, uh, some of the preserve owned by uh, um, the various land trusts that are uh, doing this work. Uh, but also there's a lot of other uh, smaller projects and local projects that can be uh, effectively done. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll go through some examples of all of these, so I'm not going to read off the list to you. Um, but uh, before I do, I want to just kind of go through some of the benefits of this work, because it is beneficial and valuable. Uh, so definitely, uh, green infrastructure is about uh, purifying and making water and soil more healthy and more resilient and more sustainable. Uh, and especially with uh, water, that means both surface water and water that's getting into the ground and, and people at least in the, in the outlying suburbs are depending on for their water supply. Uh, reduced flood and erosion. Uh, and I, I love just biodiversity, the idea of biodiversity by itself, all these plants and animals living in healthy communities and especially uh, pollinators and insects, uh, birds, all of their populations are crashing across the country. And so this is our work to try to um, help them survive and help these populations recover. And then I believe these plants and, and animals are nice to look at and infinitely interesting. Um, we can create low maintenance landscape and reduce or avoid entirely some of these inputs and fossil fuels uh, that were, um, are contributing to climate change. And then uh, public events, um, education, engagement, partnerships, and I'm going to get to the economic benefits in a second. But first, I want to call out some of the uh, local groups that I've uh, been working with in uh, uh, some of the projects that I'm going to describe in a few moments. Um, the Park District and the Village have been the main sponsors and landowners uh, for the projects we've been working on. Uh, but we have uh, our uh, environmental action team, Boy Scouts, high school kids, uh, corporate uh, sponsor, Siemens Company. Uh, the Rotary Club just uh, did a, a couple of planting projects uh, with us over the weekend and uh, the Buffalo Grove Garden Club. It's always great to have them come out and get their um, expert help in supervising planting projects. So uh, I love working with all these groups and it's part of what keeps me uh, active and involved. Uh, but as to the economic value, this was a recently published uh, uh, study uh, by Lake County Forest Preserve District uh, related to the annual dollar value of land acquisition and volunteer hours. So when we uh, do uh, land management and ecological restoration, we get significant dollar benefits in terms of this water purification, erosion and flood control, and storage of carbon, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it underground or in uh, the, the tissues of plants. And the estimate is that just preserved, any open preserved land is gonna be worth at least $5,000 an acre. Uh, but if it is restored using green infrastructure principles and practices to a level of environmental and ecological integrity, that value jumps up five times to $25,000 an acre. And if it's high quality habitat and restored land, it goes up again um, to uh, $35,000 an acre. 
And so uh, that is not including the, uh, uh, the enhanced property values of the surrounding properties and the homes that have trees on them. I uh, heard the uh, National uh, Forest Service uh, estimate today that just having um, a mature tr urban tree canopy increases uh, housing and property values by a minimum of 10%. And then there's all the recreation and other values for people um, in, in uh, having nice uh, uh, public lands and private protected lands. So I'm just gonna run through a quick list of green, uh, uh, green infrastructure projects, large and small. I'm gonna start out with the largest one I've been really actively involved in, and that is Deer Grove Forest Preserve. I've been so involved in that, I even got a little wetland uh, that the volunteers named Weiss Wetland. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, but this area was uh, uh, restored by uh, a combination of uh, uh, open lands and Stantec was their contractor. And then the Deer Grove Natural Area Volunteers, I think there's a couple on this, uh, on this Zoom call. And they started out with this core area of uh, 135 acres in the middle of this preserve. Uh, and all of these uh, green areas are wetlands that were restored. Uh, but then in the past 12 years now, the uh, uh, volunteers have been expanding and expanding beyond these yellow borders. Uh, and uh, the results of their work are truly impressive. And every weekend uh, there's uh, work going on at Deer Grove Forest Preserve. Um, kudos to them and kudos to all the people who volunteer and, and work in our uh, preserves and natural areas. Um, this one was funded uh, by uh, uh, the, when O'Hare uh, runways were expanded, um, they had to mitigate uh, the, the, the wetlands that were destroyed in the uh, expansion. So half of that money went to uh, Deer Grove Forest Preserve is over 2 million bucks. Uh, but the uh, resources have been stored very, very carefully. And the work that's been done has been very, very successful and very impressive. So I urge you to come out. And if you haven't seen this uh, at Deer Grove East, uh, please do. Another project very near and dear to me is uh, Buffalo Grove Prairie. Uh, Buffalo Grove Prairie is a 10 acre site under ComEd lines next, uh, be tucked in between an industrial park and some train tracks. Uh, but you get, you walk inside and it's remnant prairie, never been plowed. So you see the most splendid, uh, beautiful uh, plants in uh, a setting that you would never see in a recreation or a prairie. Uh, uh, restoration. So this is uh, the legacy that we have from 10,000 years ago at the end of the Ice Age. And uh, this prairie has been uh, worked on by the Prairie Guardians for uh, now 35 years. And I've been steward at Buffalo. I've been honored and privileged to be steward at Buffalo Grove Prairie for the past four years. And uh, it's uh, uh, one of my favorite, favorite places to visit, particularly this time of year. Uh, and then uh, this one I was involved in, this was a Village of Buffalo Grove project, his first village project I'm going to talk about. Uh, but this is a stream bank restoration. Buffalo Creek uh, comes out of uh, uh, Buffalo Creek Forest Preserve at Arlington Heights Road and flows through uh, uh, the Buffalo Grove Golf Course. But before it gets there, there's this little area called the Buffalo Creek Nature Preserve. And this was one of those streams with those high slumping stream banks. And... Uh, uh, the village went ahead and uh, 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 applied for a grant under the Clean Water Act Section 319 program. I think they got $170,000. Uh, and then they had to uh, match that with their own uh, cost and labor. Um, but that resulted in this uh, over 1,000 feet of stream being very, very nicely restored. Um, groups came along including Siemens and the Rotary Club and donated trees. And we've had many volunteer events uh, to uh, uh, help uh, restore the vegetation in this area. Uh, but this is, a pretty this is a case of some pretty heavy lifting where um, I believe it was 70 trucks full of uh, material were trucked out of here to uh, reduce the slope of these stream banks and allow vegetation to 
uh, take over and protect them from further erosion. It's uh, quite a successful project and I'm proud of, uh, of what we've accomplished here. And then another one, I applied for a grant uh, for this one. Uh, this is a case where Buffalo Creek was uh, diverted around a, uh, uh, a new uh, subdivision back in the early 90s, or maybe the 80s before there were uh, uh, stormwater ordinances. And it's been fighting to get back into its old channel ever since. Uh, so this is a case of green infrastructure involving hard armoring. Uh, in order to protect the trail that provides access to this park, uh, we needed to install these bags of, uh, of uh, boulders uh, because uh, it was just tearing up this land, working its way toward uh, the trail that was the only way to access the park. So uh, we got a grant from Lake County Stormwater uh, uh, Management Commission, Watershed Assistant Grant, and we did this hard armoring uh, because it was not feasible to do a, uh, a gentle uh, project using uh, uh, native plants. However, we have, uh, uh, since this was completed, uh, installed plantings along and into these, uh, uh, these bags of boulders called gabions, and uh, the area is starting to take on a more natural look. Uh, but uh, those are, and this one uh, is a per permeable paver uh, project. We got an OSLED grant, another granting agency. I think the grant amount was uh, just under $80,000 to install a very long uh, driveway with these permeable pavers. And uh, one of the features of these pavers is they have, an, uh, they have uh, pipes underneath them uh, to allow the water to drain away and uh, to be able to clean them out and keep the pavers so that they don't get clogged up. But anyway, those uh, pipes have pipe covers coming out into the grassy areas um, along the driveway. And uh, we've established very nice uh, native planting beds to, to hide those covers and to protect them from getting run over by mowers. Uh, so that this one is kind of a double green infrastructure uh, reducing uh, the amount of uh, stormwater runoff getting into the stream and also providing an opportunity for us to install seven uh, native planting beds along the sides of this uh, parking lot. So what I've talked about so far, are all big expensive projects that are probably way beyond the individual reach of uh, most of the participants in this call. So I want to just turn my attention now and talk to you about the projects that you can do at home and the smallest scale. Uh, my home is uh, Conservation at Home Certified. Open Lens is a certifying agency in our area. And uh, I have uh, two shady rain gardens that I'm proud of because it's not always easy to get uh, uh, native, wet native plants established in shade. Uh, but these plants are thriving. You can see the wild geraniums in flower. This was taken yesterday. Irises, uh, um, there's some uh, foxglove beard tongue or penstemon. I love my little uh, violets. And in all, I've got about 70 different species of plants growing in my yard. Uh, most of them are in this uh, um, shady area. And then my little pride and joy is this uh, now 12 foot white oak tree. I bought it, I didn't buy it. I got it as a free tree. It was a whip. It was about a foot tall and thinner than a pencil when I put it in. And this tree has just taken off in this site. And uh, white oak of course is our state tree and uh, uh, it's got a happy home hopefully for a uh, hundred years or more to come. Now, Peggy, I think in her introduction mentioned plant sales and uh, plant sales are a great place to stock up on these native plants. Uh, CFC, Citizen for Conservation is over now for the year. They had another uh, record uh, sale this year. And I think virtually all of the native plant sales set records. So um, this green infrastructure at home idea, I think is taking off. Uh, CFC also has a program uh, where, the, where you can bring home uh, seedlings of some of the uh, rare or unusual um, native plants 
and plant them in your yard. The deal is you, you take them home and plant them. You have to harvest the seeds and return them to CFC for their, um, for their seed uh, program. But that is another way to get involved and engaged in this idea of uh, green infrastructure and using these native plants. So that's the kind of at home angle and there's a lot more things you can do at home. Uh, so I will pause and see, uh, are there any uh, questions at this point, Liz, that think might, people might wanna take up? Um, I don't see any questions that are popping up, although I did have a couple of people um, who chimed in with some projects that they are working on. Um, so Donna said that, um, she is starting the restoration of Still Farm in Bull Valley, um, and they're now working on restoring the roadway habitat, which is really great. Um, and then Peggy actually mentioned that there's a group in Barrington um, that's trying to eradicate teasel along the roadsides, uh, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. yeah. So Peggy lives uh, on the other side of uh, Deer Grove. Or actually, I think it's Deer Grove East, but she lives uh, very, very close to uh, um, where the wood starts at Deer Grove. And so I've done some uh, uh, project work very close to Peggy's yard. And uh, one of the invasive plants there is Tree of Heaven, which is uh, kind of a, a problem. But mm. yeah, lots of opportunities. And Bull Creek, I, I want to react to that. Uh, McHenry County is very, very involved in a project called Hackbatech. Uh, it's our closest uh, 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 wildlife, excuse me, I forget the designation of Hackbatech Natural, uh, National uh, Wilderness, not Wilderness Area, but it is uh, got a uh, national designation and many stakeholders and projects are happening out at, at Hackbatech. And it's very, very exciting. So cool. thank you, Bull Valley, for uh, what you're doing on, uh, with that. Um, I do have a couple of questions that just came in um, since we're pausing. Um, are there techniques or considerations that you have made when working adjacent to bean or corn cropland? Corn cropland, wow. Um, I don't have any firsthand experience other than um, my wife and I own uh, farmland up in Wisconsin and we do, uh, we have a wildflower garden there next to a crop that's in, or next to a field that's in uh, corn and soybean rotation and alfalfa rotation. Um, but no, I, I, I don't, that's an interesting question. I don't have any advice on that, except to say that Having a, a field in a corn crop is a very good way to uh, hold off uh, invasive plants until the land is ready for restoration. So in other words, a, a lot of times in uh, forest preserves when they acquire new land, they will continue to rent the land to farmers to put into uh, row crops uh, with minimal uh, inputs of fertilizer and pesticides, of course. Uh, but that will be a good way to start out with a blank slate uh, for um, a prairie restoration project rather than uh, letting it go fallow and develop some of these uh, invasive plants. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Mark is wondering um, how effective permeable pavers are at reducing water runoff. Is that a thing you know about? I, I don't have any statistics for you, Mark, uh, but I believe it, it's very effective. I, uh, uh, just from personal observation, I spent a lot of time at the parking lot. Uh, uh, this is near our pool where I'm, uh, I work with volunteers to maintain those seven uh, native plant gardens. And um, I can't say I've stood out there and watched during a thunderstorm, but I believe that uh, those pavers do keep uh, significant amount of uh, water out of the stream. Great. Um, can you suggest plants that are good to plant along the roadway? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is such a great question. So plants along a road, and I've got a slide uh, uh, coming up on that. So let, let's just hold that thought because um, I have some comments about uh, planting along roads. 
Okay. But thank you for that question. And I'll, I'll get to that in a few slides. Okay. Why don't you continue on? Um, and then we will tackle some more questions at the okay, end. Okay, cool. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for the questions. Uh, so back to Martha West Park. This is my grandkids' favorite park. Uh, it was uh, a little neighborhood park. Uh, my wife uh, uh, retired after 20 years, uh, 22 years on the board of the park district. And so they named this little neighborhood park after her. And, and uh, this is so close, I can't resist spending a lot of my time there. We have a sunny uh, pollinator garden. It's about uh, 15 feet wide by 20 feet long. This isn't a very flattering picture of it. Uh, but we also have directly behind the uh, sign, um, I think that's an old picture. Uh, well, that's a, there was a tree directly behind the sign, a giant uh, uh, Norway uh, maple that died. And so we converted that into a shady pollinator garden. And that thing has really, really come on very nicely uh, in the past three years. So these are examples that uh, the park district said, uh, you know, I approached the park district and said, told them what I wanted to do. And they said, sure, go for it. And not only that, they delivered uh, large loads of mulch from the water reclamation district. It's a product called, um, uh, it's a biosolids product uh, called EQ compost, uh, extra quality, I guess, exceptional quality. Uh, but that stuff makes for wonderful, wonderful media for raised beds and for um, establishing native plantings. And the best, two best parts about it are it's free and they deliver it free. Uh, so contact the, uh, if, you're, if you're in Cook County, contact the uh, uh, Water Reclamation District of greater, uh, of greater Chicago and get some of this EQ compost material, it's dynamite. Uh, another place where we use that same uh, material is at Green Lake Park. Uh, this is one of our uh, large community parks uh, near our home. And last year, I teamed up with the Rotary Club, Garden Club, the Environmental Action Team, and this year with Lions Club, uh, who got grants from uh, Lake County Stormwater Management and the ComEd Green Region Grant, uh, $7,000 grant from ComEd. Uh, we've had uh, 90 volunteers come out for a spring planning event and a fall planning event, 50 in the spring, 40 in the fall. And we did uh, three Eagle Scout service projects all at Green Lake Park, all in 2021. Uh, and uh, uh, among other things, we established a native uh, tree and shrub arboretum in this park. So the arboretum, uh, uh, we started it in spring and fall last year. We did all the plantings, uh, purchased uh, 50 different species of native uh, plants from three different native shrubs from three different nurseries and um, some trees, not many trees. Um, and we planted them uh, uh, to start the nursery. Uh, we also planted under those cottonwood trees that you might have seen. We planted uh, woodland plants. Uh, and then in the swale, in the sunny swale, we planted uh, uh, some wetland plants right at the bottom of the swale and prairie plants going up to the side to establish a nice uh, 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 native planting area. So you can kind of see that planting going on. Uh, 50 volunteers uh, spread between these areas. It was just a delightful. Uh, time and the plantings have taken off and been very, very successful uh, despite the drought last year. Uh, so it was fairly um, a modest expense. And uh, this year we're continuing to uh, put in trees. The, the Lions Club, as I said, purchased additional trees. Uh, we're installing signs and tags uh, so that people can uh, learn about these plants and uh, incorporate them into their home landscapes, maybe take out some, uh, uh, take out some honeysuckles and uh, uh, put in some of these native shrubs instead. So just to give you a feel, uh, there is a big grassy area at this park uh, that was nothing but turf grass. And the inset is a photo of one of these planting beds. I took this picture uh, yesterday and the Iowa crabs in the middle I had just finished blooming. I should have been out there last week. Uh, but there's five different species of shrubs in this bed. And there's uh, 
six or seven other beds, uh, some sunny, some shady, some dry, some wet, uh, sprinkled across this park. And uh, when we put up the tags, they will have uh, a QR code on each tag so that visitors to the Arboretum uh, can look up these plants. The, the QR code goes to the Illinois Wildflowers database, uh, which gives a lot of information about these plants and how to use them uh, in the home uh, landscape setting. So here's uh, just a quick list of the large shrubs and the small shrubs that we established uh, in this arboretum and uh, tried to pay particular attention to the pollinator um, uh, and host plant uh, associations with these shrubs and trees. So it's all very nice and good to, to provide pollinators with nectaring opportunities uh, but they also need places to lay their eggs uh, where those uh, caterpillars can get uh, uh, forage and, uh, and complete their life cycle. So in addition to being pollinator plants, these are also host plants for these uh, insects. And that was another objective of this uh, arboretum was to establish um, uh, forage opportunities for these herb herbivorous uh, insects. Ah, so now um, this was our first project in Buffalo Grove. This goes back oh, about 15 years now. Um, uh, well, maybe not quite that long because the environmental action team has only been around 13 years. So this is one of the first things uh, we did with the environmental action team was uh, approach Siemens Corporation. They're our largest employer in Buffalo Grove. This is our metro station uh, and they have uh, uh, a lot of employees and they have uh, buses, shuttles that they send to the station to pick up their employees. So I thought, well, shoot, uh, all of these uh, Siemens employees are uh, visiting the train station. Let's give them something nice to look at when they walk uh, out of the station in, and see this uh, retention pond. And so Siemens uh, um, forked over uh, money for uh, seeds and for seedlings and they, uh, sent a bunch of their employees out to help plant uh, and install uh, uh, plugs at the site. And it's turned out pretty nice. So we've uh, taken these uh, pond shorelines out of uh, goldenrod and reed canary grass and put them into uh, a nice variety of native plants. Um, and then there's this other little uh, stretch uh, along the uh, ramp where commuters uh, walked on their way to the parking lot. And I was out here this morning um, uh, and we've established a little sliver of uh, native planting beds. Uh, this one is from uh, last year ago and it's not very colorful, uh, but we have uh, been uh, um, uh, installing more plants and enriching this, uh, this little area. So um, uh, these green infrastructure projects can pop up in all kinds of different places. Uh, and you can uh, get your organization involved and publicize your organization, put a little sign in there, create interest in uh, native plants and get some uh, kudos for your organization, uh, limited only by uh, your imagination and the energy you're willing to put into it. Uh, so ever since I started uh, with the slide in my yard, all of these are projects that are uh, done fairly easily and without any engineering, without any consulting services, without any permit, legal permits required. Um, so these projects are really uh, very doable. And uh, depending on the scale you want to take on, um, uh, I'm happy to talk to anyone about any of these projects, opportunities, anytime. <coughs> This is another uh, project uh, we did uh, with Siemens. Again, they uh, contributed money for the plantings and they sent their employees out on a Friday uh, morning uh, uh, to help us plant. Uh, they gave them lunch and they got, home, they got to go home early. Um, you can't beat a deal like that. Uh, so this one is a, uh, a dry basin. This was just a mowed turf uh, dry basin uh, rarely collects any water, but it's right next to Buffalo Creek, and it's also right next to our village hall, which is across the uh, basin. So the first year we put in, a, I don't know, a few hundred plugs of different plants. They've done very well. 
uh, but this is a, about a fifth of an acre basin. So it was far more than we had budget to put in plugs. So what did we do? Well, we put in a, a mix, a seed mix, uh, but very um, wisely, we included a lot of black-eyed Susan seeds and a lot of Canada wild rye seeds in our mix. And by 4th of July that first year, people were walking by this basin on their way to 4th of July fireworks and just saying, ooh and ah. And they weren't talking about the fireworks. They were talking about all the black-eyed Susans blooming here. It was spectacular. And black-eyed Susans and Canada wild rye, they're early uh, species. They kind of go away and uh, other things take over. But in the, I think this has been seven or eight years we've had this every year, it's been something different that's flushed and just produced beautiful, beautiful blooms. Uh, so it's a continuing source of, uh, of beauty and wonder and it's never the same two years in a row. So, um, and it gives our village a little opportunity to spread the message about green infrastructure using their um, design. Um, Farrington Corridor. Um, so now um, I'm going to talk about a corridor project. Um, we have uh, in our community uh, two, three community parks uh, lined up. So the Green Lake Park, where I showed you the uh, Arboretum, is on the north end. We have our largest community park, uh, Mike Rilko Park, uh, just south of that, uh, and just across uh, um, Highway 83, um, McHenry Road, uh, we have this little corridor that's owned by the village. And it's, um, uh, you can see, perhaps if you look sharp in the middle, you can see uh, Farrington uh, Ditch running through it. Um, but this area we funded with a ComEd uh, Green Region Grant, $10,000. And that money allowed us to purchase uh, oak. Um, we, we purchased, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna say 40 or 50, 50 uh, uh, decent sized oak trees, uh, mostly bur oaks to plant in the, in the wooded area after we took out the buckthorn and honeysuckle. Uh, we have a deep basin where we've uh, taken out the Phragmites and the uh, cattails and have established uh, warrior sedges and burr reeds and uh, uh, what's the other plant we've got in there? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, one more, one I'm not so sure of, River Bullrush, it seems to be fairly aggressive. Uh, but those, that area looks great. Um, uh, we've really uh, knocked off the, uh, uh, those uh, unholy trinity plants that were in there. And this uh, lower basin along uh, the creek is kind of a floodplain uh, and it is uh, just flourishing. It was uh, mostly all uh, teasel and, uh, uh, bird's foot trefoil a few years ago. Those are some uh, of the invasive plants, but they are under control and uh, native plants are truly flourishing in this area. And so this connects up to another park, uh, uh, Willow Stream Park, where we've been doing some, uh, some restoration work. And that connects up to our golf course and then Buffalo Creek. So what we've got really is a mile long uh, corridor of habitats uh, we're doing some project work uh, along and hope to get into the golf course. Um, and uh, it virtually connects up two of the watersheds, uh, the Aptikissi Creek and the Buffalo Creek that run east and west through our community. So this is a, a really, um, I believe, a great example of using this idea of habitat corridors. Uh, now we have uh, a lot of uh, turf grass in our community. And uh, last year we got a grant uh, from the um, Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation, uh, which has been a real, real uh, big benefactor for uh, other projects in, uh, uh, that Citizens for Conservation is working on. But in our case, they gave us uh, 10,000 uh, bucks. We killed the, uh, the grass in a grassy basin and in this uh, large uh, uh, expanse of uh, turf. Uh, we avoided the uh, expense of uh, hiring guys to mow it 20 times a summer and have established uh, six acres of native plants uh, to um, 
provide all of the benefits I've been talking about. And we got another grant, this, this one for $20,000 to do uh, similar work uh, at three different sites uh, in the Buffalo Grove Park District. So very, very excited. Um, these are pretty easy projects. Um, the first step is to, uh, is to knock out the turf grass. Uh, second step is to scatter uh, seeds at and the proper type of seed mixes in the, in the correct uh, seed densities. Uh, and the third step is to watch them grow. Um, we uh, not sure where they're gonna need to mow them this year, uh, but when they uh, come along after a few years, we will start including them in our burn program, which I'm gonna talk about in a few slides. So um, this is a, an example of a project that is, uh, was uh, virtually free to our uh, landowner public agency and accomplished in, uh, I'm gonna say less than 30 hours of labor, uh, including my volunteer time. Now, finally, we get to talk about plants along roadways. And I have seen many, many failed uh, roadway projects uh, where uh, along highways and in medians uh, that were uh, put into prairie plants, uh, they get invaded um, and the, the biggest problem in my experience with uh, roadways are when uh, salt gets applied in the winter and the salt gets slushy, cars roll through and they kick up the salt spray. And salt spray is very toxic uh, to most plants. That's one of the reasons why Phragmites and cattails and reed canary grass are so successful is they are very salt, salt tolerant. Uh, but in this, uh, in this particular median, it's very narrow. And we use the same type of mix that we put into our, uh, our basins. So it was a mix that was heavy with um, uh, Canada wild rye and black eyed Susans. Uh, but there's also uh, probably 20 or 25 other common prairie species put in here. And this picture I took last, uh, late last fall, but it was extraordinary how diverse this was and how many different species I saw. Um, so can I identify them all from here? No, I cannot, but I can see that there's still Canada wild rye in the foreground. Uh, there were some uh, daisy flea beans and some weedy things, uh, but there were also some very nice asters and uh, uh, I, I, my, my recollection is there are about 20 different species growing in this median that's about two feet wide. Now, the only maintenance that we've done on it is uh, going through with a, uh, uh, a brush cutter, like a weed whacker, and trimming down the height of these plants uh, to about two feet in, um, in June or early July. And that helps... Uh, prevent them from reaching their full height and also prevents them from getting too leggy and flopping over the edge of the media. Uh, so pruning, uh, pruning these plants uh, in um, early and midsummer, I think is a good practice. Uh, it tames them down, it keeps their heights down and, it, and they flower much more fully uh, than they, and, and suffer much less uh, floppiness than they would if, if they were not pruned. So I don't know whether I've gotten to all the dimensions of the question about roadway plants, uh, but they can succeed. Um, but uh, salt is really, really a big issue with these plants and they are, are very prone, roadway plantings are very prone to being invaded by things like teasel, um, phragmites, reed canary grass and things that are more salt tolerant. So I don't know, maybe the, the questioner uh, uh, has, some, uh, uh, has, some, has a more specific question on that. Anything, Liz? You're on mute. I'm not seeing anything for that one. Okay, anything else? Uh, you want to bring up? 
I do have a handful of questions that have come in in the last couple of minutes, if you'd like to field those, otherwise we can hang on to them till the end. Yeah, sure. Let's, All let's, right. uh, let's so I have get someone people here in the conversation. Says, sure. There is a piece of land next to the inlet of Highland Lake that is supposedly consisting of dumped fill. We don't know where to start to make this into a healthy habitat for native plants. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, dumped fill could be anything. And uh, soil matters. Soil is, uh, so, you know, these native plants are not fussy, uh, but uh, they each have kind of their own um, preferences. So without knowing more about the contents of this dumped soil, and um, uh, I, I really can't give you any, any advice on it. Try, try a, try a, be more guided by uh, how much sunlight it gets and how well it drains. And then depending on those two factors, put in a mix with a uh, seed mix with as many different species as you can that, that meet those, uh, those criteria and let the, uh, let the soil and the seeds select for each other. Okay. Um, William's wondering why more swaths of power lines aren't places for native plant corridors. Do you know if there's a reason for that? Yeah, we're working those in Buffalo Grove. Uh, but uh, one reason why they're not used more is that they have been over the years uh, poorly maintained underneath. Uh, so they are uh, uh, large refuges of degraded habitat depending on whether it's wet or dry underneath, uh, they have uh, they've filled up with brush or uh, Phragmites, reed canary grass and cattails or teasel, depending on how, whether they're wet or dry or sun or shade. Uh, so that's one of the, and that's a lot of work to undo the harm after an area's become invaded and degraded. Um, but I can tell you that ComEd, uh, is trying. They, they have a program and they have a contractor that is uh, taking care of a lot of these uh, rights of way. And uh, if you have a particular area that you would like to uh, uh, try to work on, um, let me know and I can uh, connect you to my contact at ComEd. Uh, they would probably do an evaluation, get to know you and decide whether they were, your site was something they that uh, they would be willing to uh, uh, spend some resources to fix up. Sure. Um, Mark is wondering if you purchase your mixes or you make them with collected seeds. I'm coming to that. Thank okay. you for the question. I'm coming to that in a couple of slides. And then Jackson wonders what the technique is that you used for knocking out the turf grass. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, glyphosate. Glyphosate and uh, uh, near the end of the growing season, I, I, I become a big convert to fall um, planting, fall uh, work. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we broadcast uh, uh, Roundup or Aquatic approved Roundup, depending on how wet the area is, uh, uh, to knock out the grass. Uh, we leave the thatch because that provides a good seed bed, uh, but we knock out the uh, knock out the grass, uh, leave it for a couple of weeks, and then try to plant into it uh, before the first frost. So as the season, as the winter season progressive, progresses, the uh, freeze thaw cycles open up the soil and let the seeds in and stratifies them. And the, um, the thatch from the grass keeps them from washing away if, the, if, if, if it gets wet. And by spring, we're getting a nice uh, seed response. Makes sense. Um, and then how do you per, uh, permanently remove, uh, you've said this like five times and I keep forgetting how to say it, the Phragmites? Phragmites, Phragmites yeah. That's what it is, yeah. How do you permanently remove it? Well, yes. that's a great question. Uh, some combination of uh, spraying and burning and spraying again and uh, 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 spraying again. Uh, again, this is... Uh, I, I hate the idea of using environmental poisons to improve the environment, but to me, it's kind of a binary thing. Either you want uh, to do the right herbicide and the right concentration at the right time to maximize its impact and to reduce the, uh, 
the, the, the and, and try to eliminate as, as much collateral damage as you can. But the, the only way to get rid of it uh, practically is uh, either going through the bulldozer and scraping it out or herbiciding. Since uh, bulldozers can't get into most of these wet areas, uh, uh, herbicide applications are the only things that work. But sometimes in combination with mowing, and if you can burn your area, those three, those are the three tools for getting rid of Phragmites. The main tool for keeping Phragmites out is to establish competitive plants. And those are a relatively small number of sedges uh, called the warrior sedges. So Citizens for Conservation has a lot of information about that. Uh, and uh, a number of other plants such as um, iris, blue flag iris, um, depending on how wet, there's a, a number of other semi-wet or emergent plants that can be used to uh, establish a thick ground cover that will uh, uh, inhibit return of those invasive wetland plants. Makes sense. Um... And then Donna's wondering if spot spraying or hand painting is a good way to take care of a smaller area. Yes, very definitely. Um, uh, spot spraying or hand wicking. I've done uh, many hundreds of hours of individual rubbing herbicide over the stems of these plants um, is a good way to prevent damage to the beneficial and conservative plants that might be growing near them. Uh, but for large degraded areas uh, where there's nothing but those invasive plants, that's where I'm uh, suggesting broadcast spraying. Got it. Uh, that's all the questions that we have here. Um, so we go ahead. I have some other slides, but I'm uh, past my hour. So uh, you are I'm good. Thinking. Yep, go for it. Uh, so here's some of the programs that we've put together locally in Buffalo Grove, and all the conservation organizations use these programs, but we have a burn team made up of the village and the park district. I was the burn manager. Illinois requires a, a, a certified person uh, to be in charge and be present. I was that person, but now we've got people from both the village and the park district who are getting their certification. Uh, but prescribed burning is uh, one of the very best uh, tools for maintaining uh, these uh, these areas once they've been reestablished in native plants. All of our native plants have been adapted and evolved over the past 10,000 years to um, uh, withstand fire and actually to benefit from periodic fire. So this is a really valuable tool and uh, it's a little complicated because we don't want it to get away and cause uh, uh, wildfire, but uh, uh, learn more about burning, it's good. And then another program that we've got, oops, going too fast. Uh, we have a, a nursery uh, set up uh, in one of our water treatment, uh, behind the fence in one of our water treatment plants. And uh, uh, we grow about 300 or 400 of these uh, sedges uh, every year for planting out into our natural areas. I start them on my patio and then I stick them in these gallon uh, uh, landscaping cans. Uh, we float them in the water. We keep the, this is a rubber uh, uh, cover around this bed. We keep them wet all summer. And by uh, August and September, we got these nice chubby plants with root systems and they're already sprouting uh, new plants for next year. Uh, and we stick those out into uh, these uh, natural areas that we're working on, the wet areas. And then finally, I'm gonna get the answer to the seed question. Uh, we do have a, a volunteer seed collecting cleaning program. Uh, last year, we collected uh, more than 80 different species of native plants and uh, totaled more than 100 pounds. Uh, uh, we get together, the Boy Scouts and other community members come together for this uh, seed cleaning event. And then we take all of the seeds, 100 pounds of seeds that we've got, we split them into mixes for prairies, woodlands, and wetlands. Uh, and then, because even 100 pounds of seeds is a lot of seeds, but it probably isn't going to cover more than about 10 acres. And we're working on uh, 
probably 30 or 40 acres of new areas at the moment. We need a lot more seeds. So we've gone out to uh, uh, reputable seed companies and purchased uh, various mixes. Uh, some of the companies that we, we've we used is Prairie Moon Nursery, and then there's uh, uh, Agricol and uh, Genesis Nursery. Those are three of the uh, of the nurseries that uh, we've established relationships with. But we take the locally collected seeds from our volunteers, we mix them up with the purchased seeds, and then those new mixes are the ones that go out into our restoration projects. And I, I think it's conservative, but uh, I estimate that we save uh, the park district and the village about ten dollars to $15,000 a year for uh, the seeds that we uh, give them versus purchasing that amount of seeds. So I have a series of slides about the green infrastructure network in Buffalo Grove. I am gonna skip that for tonight. Um, and I'm gonna get on with the conclusion and see whether there's any other, um, see whether there's any other uh, questions or discussion. What, maybe I'll stop here. Uh, one thing that we do uh, is that we maintain uh, these areas and uh, we like to measure how they're doing. And so uh, one way of measuring is to assess the number of species and the number of native species and their, how um, conservative they are, how likely you are to find them in, an, uh, in, a, in a healthy uh, habitat. And, the, and there's a calculation called floristic quality index that uh, allows you to uh, get a generate a number uh, that you can compare over time, look for improvement over time, and you can compare with other places. So this is uh, a comparison between the Buffalo Grove Prairie, which is the na native remnant prairie that I've been a uh, steward at for many years, uh, with one of our degraded Phragmites marshes. So the difference in scores between a 63 and a 3.7 is just uh, one illustration of how far this some of these uh, degraded areas have to go to be um, healthy. All right, so just to wrap this up, uh, some of the things that I think we've learned working together uh, over the years is that uh, communications with neighbors and community involvement are, are critically important. Uh, we've uh, discovered and accessed a wide variety of funding sources and labor sources uh, to get this work done. Uh, some kinds of green infrastructure are easy and cheap, like converting turf to prairie. That's pretty easy and, and cheap. Uh, reclaiming degraded areas uh, under power lines, Phragmites marshes, uh, uh, buckthorn forests. That's difficult, expensive, and takes years and years to accomplish. So you know, it helps to choose your openings uh, and, and not waste your time on things that are just not going to uh, uh, be possible without extreme amounts of uh, work and, and expense. Um, I, I think one of the lessons of starting with that little uh, village hall basin was starting small um, and, and gaining confidence. Uh, that one was uh, a winner in it, and it really won over a lot of fans to the idea of green infrastructure. And then don't start projects, start small, but so don't even start small projects without a plan to maintain them over time, uh, because they will um, uh, require uh, maintenance and some uh, invasive control uh, over time. Uh, tasks, tasks can be structured and scheduled for uh, flexible use of uh, staff time and volunteer time, and they can be done all around the year. So brush removal is great time for uh, that in fall and winter and spring. Uh, seed collecting in uh, summer, especially late summer and fall. Uh, planting plugs in spring and fall. Um, you can do all of, you can do this work year round. And then the last thing is uh, results take time and persistence, sometimes an infinite amount of time and almost an inf infinite amount of persistence. Uh, just keep cutting, burning, and planting, and things good things will happen. So uh, that's what I got for you tonight. Um, 
Here's a little blurb for my uh, watershed group. We have two watersheds, Flint Creek and Spring Creek. They're, they're wonderful areas. Uh, visit our website, Flint Creek, Spring Creek Watersheds.org. Uh, we have watershed plans. Uh, we're working on updating the Spring Creek plan at the moment. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful watershed. It starts down here in Hoffman Estates. Uh, actually, the stream flows north through Barrington Hills, a little bit of East Dundee, and ends up in the Fox River at Fox River Grove. Uh, we collect and, and uh, study water samples. Uh, but one of the wonderful things about this Spring Creek watershed, all this green area is Spring Creek Forest Preserve. It is a massive preserve of 4,000 acres. The Forest Preserves recently bought another added piece called Horizon Farm. So it's nearly 5,000 acres of really, really nice habitat. So this is a major core area. And now with our watershed plan, we're trying to build uh, uh, connections to other core areas and corridors uh, to help with all of these uh, goals that I mentioned earlier. The key group involved in that is the Barrington Greenway Initiative, uh, sponsored again by Citizens for Conservation. Uh, this is a group picture of the Spring Creek Stewarts. It's one of the groups collaborating with Citizens for Conservation. Uh, learn more about the Barrington Greenway Initiative. They're doing amazing things. And then don't forget Liz's event. It sounds spectacular. Saturday. So. It'll be fun. And here, I don't know if uh, Peggy wants to chime in again, but here is uh, my contact information and some information uh, about the Living Corridors uh, organization. And Peggy, I'm not hearing from you, so I'm just going to go to your last slide, uh, which is the next program on the uh, schedule for CLC.